Hi everyone and welcome to uh, the video lecture for sections uh, 2.1 and I'm not exactly sure how far we'll make it uh, but this is the module 5 material so it begins with section 2.1 and ends with section 2.4 uh, so we'll be looking at a lot of interesting things uh, functions versus relations um, and then we'll start to actually look at uh, uh, some general functions, linear functions, but we'll, we'll be getting involved with function notation, which is very useful, and how many things are done. Uh, functions are used everywhere, especially computer programming, um, but, but the basic uh, notion in math is going to be very cool as well. Um, so, with that being said, they start talking about relations. So, in the notes sections, let's just do some distinctions. Uh, so, what is a relation? Well, a relation is just any set of ordered pairs. So just a whole bunch of collections of things of the form x, y. So you could have a bunch of them, x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on. You could even have infinitely many. Uh, so an example of that, you know, you could have something like 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 10, 10. And that would be a perfectly fine relation. Um, but we can only get so far with relations. <clears throat> um, oh, no, there's. let me talk about, uh, in general, we can also talk about... Um, the domain and range of a relation. So notice that uh, the domain of a relation is the set of all possible x values. So in this case, um, the domain of the above example, I'll just call it DOM for short, would be the set containing, we look at all the x values, 1, 2, and 10. And the range, what the range would be, is the set of all possible y values. So we'd look at all the second coordinates. And as it turns out in this example, the relation here has range 1, 2, 10 as well. So the domain and range just happen to be the same here, but usually they will be different. Um, OK. What makes a relation into a function? So a function is really just a special kind of relation. So what makes a relation a function? So you can kind of think of the functions as the special kind of relations. Um, well, relations in general are a, a bit too general to, to say too much about. Uh, so there's a very interesting rule um, that cleans up a lot of this and allows us to do some, some very interesting analysis and, and look at these class of things. So I'm just going to tell you what the rule is and then we'll think about it. So um, a relation is a function. if and only if uh, how do I want to say this? Each input 
has only one output. Okay, so <clears throat> basically what this is set telling you is no input can go two different places. Okay, so the analogy that a lot of people like to use with uh, functions is kind of the analogy a function is like a machine. So what a function does is uh, it takes some input, it goes into the function box, and out comes the output. A lot of times later what we'll uh, be seeing is uh, the function will be given by some formula and so we take a number, we plug it in the formula, it changes the number, but out comes a new one. So something you might be familiar with is if we would say our function is like f of x equals 2x, that's a very easy one, you just double the input. Say you feed in 5 into this machine, what does the machine do? It doubles it, and out comes the output 10, and this is how we get our x, y pair 5 comma 10. But functions don't always have to be given by formulas. They can actually be a little more extract. I like to think of, um, say, a, a vending machine. What happens um, if your function is actually like a vending machine? Well, the input would be press a button. And let's assume this is a, a soda machine. And then the output would be out comes the can of soda. Okay, so we're. I'm just talking about the press the button aspect and out coming the can of soda. Forget about feeding it the money or anything complicated like that. Um, so basically, if you press. An example of this input would be, say, press Coke. And then the output would be, you get a can of Coke. Okay, what would be a bad machine? Well, a bad machine would be, let's say you press Coke. send it through the vending machine, you hit the button, and then let's say one time maybe you get a coke, and then you do it again, and then maybe the next time you get a Mountain Dew. So that would be bad because Basically, our input would be going to different places. One time we get a Coke, the next time we get a Mountain Dew. That would be a bad vending machine. When you hit the button that says what you're supposed to get, you don't necessarily get it every time. Well, that's a function. That's, so this would be an example of a relation, not a function. If the vending machine didn't do what we wanted it to do. So that's exactly the rule I'm talking about. Um, so let's look at an example with kind of numbers. So let's look at, we'll give the function, or the relation a name, we'll call it capital R, and we'll just do a bunch of ordered pairs. We'll say 1, comma, 2, 2, comma, 3, and uh, 1, comma, 4. So you have to ask yourself, um, so that in this example we want to determine, is this a function?
and what you have to do is you have to look at the inputs and see where they go. So we have two possible inputs or x values and let's see where they go. So the only two inputs we have, we have one, we have two, and then we have one again. So let's write our two inputs, one and two. Let's see where they go. Well, on the one hand, one goes to two, this output. But then, when you look at the third ordered pair, it also goes to four. And then two only goes to three. So this is not a function because the input one goes two different places. So this part right here makes it not a function. Let's look at another example. So in this example we'd say r is not a function, it's just a relation. So let's look at the example Let's call this one capital S. And let's say we have 1, 3. Um, 2, 3. And 4, 5. And we ask ourselves, is S a function? Well, again, let's draw the input-output mapping diagram. So what are our inputs this time? 1, 2, and 4. And then we have the outputs 3 and 5. Well, 1 goes to 3, 2 also goes to 3, and 4 goes to 5. Is this a function? It sure is. It sure is. I know you might have said no because you say, oh, two inputs go to the same output. But that's okay. Remember, our rule says we can't have an input go to different places. It didn't say anything about two inputs having the output, same output. So, uh, yes. S is a function. Because no input has two different outputs. In fact, if you want to look at an extreme output example, what you can do is you can take all the inputs you want and map them all to the exact same output and that will be a function. So you could look at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 as all your inputs, map them all to 2. So you'd be looking at the order pair 1, 2, 2, 2, 3 comma 2, 4 comma 2, 5 comma 2, 6 comma 2, 7 comma 2, and 8 comma 2, and that is a function. There's only one output, but there's eight different inputs, and they all only go to one place. So that would be a perfectly fine example of a function. And then also for functions, we can talk about domain and range. So uh, just if I asked you what's the domain of this function, we would just look at the input maps. So we have 1, 2, and 4 and then the range is just the outputs that it goes to, 3 and 5. So that is basically uh, the, the primer rundown on uh, relations and functions, domain and range, and how you determine if they are uh, one or the other. Um, we'll see later that this test that we just looked at for inputs and outputs actually, if you would graph these things, corresponds to a vertical line test. So if you can ever draw a vertical line through two points, it turns out that you have an input that goes two different places. So that's the, the crux of the vertical line test. Okay, so let's go back to the learning guide and try to get um, our feet wet. So some of these should be pretty easy now. Find the domain and range of the relation. So we have the domain, the range, and we just look for all the ordered pairs. Um, in general, you don't have to put these things in increasing order. But you know what, just to be safe when you're doing my math lab homework, it never hurts. Sometimes it asks for things in increasing order. So just to make sure and not have to do a problem a couple times, you may want to just put them in increasing order anyway. Okay, so the domain, it looks like we just have 3 and 4. 
um, the range, we have 4, 5, 4, 5, so we just have 4 and 5 here. If we asked ourselves, is this a function, we could see no pretty fast. Just look at the first two ordered pairs, and the input 3 goes to two different places, 4 and 5, so it cannot be a function, it's just a relation. Um, 2a, determine whether the relation is a function. Um, so we have to look at the input, does it go to two, oh, we just answered the same exact relation, so no. Uh, so we could draw, actually, both the inputs, if we want to do an input-output. We have 3, and we have 4, and both of those go to two different places. Both of them actually go to both 4 and 5, so we have 3 going to 4 and 5, and we also have 4 going to 4 and 5. So, not a function. Determine whether the relation is a function to be. Um, well, you know what? We don't have a single input that repeats. So that means each one can only go to one output. So for this example, we would say, yes, it sure is a function. Uh, so now we want to start talking about um, solve each equation for y and then determine whether or not it defines y as a function of x. <coughs> so some of these, uh, we start getting into function as a rule. So solving for y isn't too bad. Um, so that's in this case, that's all we'd have to do is subtract x squared. So y equals 16 minus x squared. And then we have to ask ourselves, um, if we plug in a value for x, x is our input value, can we ever get two different y values? And basically, it's pretty clear that that's not possible. If you plug in x squared, it's what it is what it is, and you can't get anything different. So, so this this rule. defines a function. If you plug in anything for x, x squared is a unique number, and subtracting it from 16 gives a unique y value. So each x value specifies only one y value. On the other hand, if we look at the next one, say we want to solve for y, well, how do we do that? Remember, square root principle. So that tells me if I do y on the left-hand side, I should get plus or minus the square root of x. Is this a function? This is not a function. Um, because, for instance, plug in x equals 1, you have two possible ordered pairs that come about. So you get, on the first hand, when you plug in 1, you could either get y being the positive square root of 1, which is just 1 comma 1, or you could plug in 1 and get the opposite of the square root of 1 which ends up being 1, negative 1. So this would turn out on our input-output map. It would correspond to having 1 go to both 1 and negative 1. So we have an input going two different places. Remember, whenever I say input, I'm just talking about x value. Whenever I say output, I'm just talking about y value. So that rule does not specify a function. OK. Um, now we start talking about function notation. So whenever we have a complicated formula, so a lot of the times what we'll see, let's go back to the notes section briefly. Um, so function notation. Looks like this. We have... Um, f of x equals and then some formula 
and I'll say to get the output. So the way this works is this specifies just the name of the function. What's inside the parentheses is either the value of the input or the name of the input variable. Sometimes they won't use x. And then the formula to get the output is basically just the rule that tells us how to find y. The thing you don't want to do is think that f is some variable and x is some variable and we're multiplying them. That's, that's one of the first common mistakes that you get when you see someone that looks at function notation and has never had it explained to them. What we're really doing is we're taking the value of x and we're substituting it into the formula to get our ordered pair. So um, if we had f of x is equal to say just 2x and then let's say they told us they, they, they asked the question what is f of 7? Well what we do is we feed 7 into the formula so f of 7 would equal 2 times 7 which is 14 so this would give us since this is a function we're looking for an ordered pair 7 comma 14 it gives us our input output mapping so when they look at some of these down below, that's all they want us to do is take the input value and substitute it into the formula. So g of negative 1, we just do negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 plus 3. Whenever you plug something into this input, it's crucial that you keep it in parentheses <clears throat> because sometimes they'll be doing some complex manipulations. So you got to keep it simple and go slow. So we get 1 minus 2 plus 3, and we just work from left to right. Negative 1 plus 3 gives us positive 2. So what is our ordered pair that corresponds here? Our input was negative 1, and our output was positive 2. Okay, so we're using the same formula above, but now we've got this more complex looking thing, x plus 5, that we want to plug in. It's actually not any more difficult we just look where the x is and instead replace it with x plus 5 in parentheses. So we do x plus 5 squared plus 2 times x plus 5 plus 3. <clears throat> and then to simplify things, we just go back and do our algebraic manipulations. Um, so remember, if you uh, can't remember how to do x plus 5 squared in your head, this is just x plus 5 times x plus 5, and you want to make sure to FOIL, or remember my preferred terminology, I won't let you forget it, E-T-O-T-F-T-E-T-O-T-S. Each term of the first times each term of the second. Uh, so what we end up getting is x squared plus 10x, plus 25. That's what I get from foiling. Make sure you can do that on your own. If you don't understand, come over here and actually multiply these two things out. Um, plus 2x plus 10, we need to distribute, plus 3. And then we combine our like terms. There's only 1x squared term. We have a 10x and a 2x that add up to 12x. We have a 25, a 10, and a 3 that add up to 38. So when you do g of x plus 5, in some sense that gives you a new function that has the formula x squared plus 12x plus 35. Um, this idea that we just used here um, is in some sense the most basic version of function composition. Oh, whoops. I think I went to the end. Wrong button. Excuse me. Okay, so we want to do g of negative x. Um, again, let's just remind ourselves what the formula was. Uh, remember, g of x equals x squared plus 2x plus 3. So in this case, when we do negative x, we're going to get negative x squared plus 2 times negative x plus 3. 
So this is, when you square the negative, it becomes a positive. So it's positive x squared minus 2x plus 3. And that is g of negative x. Okay, um, so they want us to graph two functions for this last example, uh, f of x and g of x, each specified by the, the formulas, the absolute value of x and the absolute value of x minus 2, <coughs> from negative 2 to 2, and they want us to look at how the graphs relate. So let's make a table of values. We'll call one f of x f of x. We'll call the other one x g of x. And they said use inputs and outputs from negative 2, positive 2, so negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. f of x is just taking the absolute value, so positive 2, positive 1, 0, positive 1, positive 2. g of x is the same thing, but we subtract each output, output value by 2, so it'll be the same output system f of x, just two smaller. So we'd get 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 1, and 0. So let's actually graph these things on the Cartesian plane. So remember, each one of these corresponds to an input-output. So the first ordered pair of f of x that we have would be negative 2, comma 2. The next one would be negative 1, comma 1, and so on. You can tell pretty quickly just by looking at the table, so I'm not going to write them all out. So for f of x, let's make these values. So each tick mark is just going to correspond to one unit. So we have the values at 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, negative 1, 1, and negative 2, comma 2. So those are our five values connect them with the line, or well, two lines I suppose, or two rays, if you want to be specific. And a lot of times, um, so we'll label our x and y axis, and then a lot of times what they'll do is they'll put the name of the function right next to the curve. g of x, we can do the same thing. So we start with negative 2, 0. Uh, negative 1, negative 1, 0, negative 2, uh, 1, negative 1, and 2, 0. And connect those with a 1, or 2 rays. So again, we have the x-axis, the y-axis, and g of x. Okay, so these graphs look almost identical. That's all we've do done is moving the points down to. So we could say when they ask how the graphs relate, we would say g of x is the graph of f of x shift down two units. All right. Um, vertical line test. So let's uh, quickly try and think about that. Remember, <clears throat> if a vertical line passes through two points, then you have an input going to two outputs. So we want to use this to determine if the graph represents a function. Well, let's look at this point. Let's estimate this, let's say, as 0 for the x and maybe 1 for the y. And then this one down here is maybe 0 for x and negative 1 for y. Well, what do we have on the input-output map? That corresponds to 0 going to 1 and negative 1. So you have an input going two different places. So the vertical line test says if you can draw a line that hits the graph in two points, it's not a function. So this is not a function. That's what they mean by it does not pass the vertical line test. If a vertical line only hits the graph in 0 or 1 places, it is a function. So if you come over here, any vertical line you draw is only going to hit the graph one time or 0 times. So this is a function. That's what we mean when we say it passes the vertical line test. It is a function. On 6, it does not. We drew a vertical line through two points, so it's not. <coughs> Let's look at 7. Uh, graphically, 
they're asking us to find g of negative 4. So what is this really asking us? Go to the x value negative 4 and see what the y value is. Well, the y value is right here. It's 2. So g of negative 4 equals 2. Or we could say the point negative 4 comma 2 is on the graph of g. Alright, so use problem 7 to find the value of x for which g of x equals 1. So what are they do they're do doing here? They're giving us a y value. And they're asking what x values actually correspond to that. So we're looking at the y value 1, and we want to see what x values do that. Well, in this case, it's this x value right here, negative 2. So this basically tells us um, the point negative 2 comma 1 is on the graph of g. Or if we want to use fancy function notation, we could say g of negative 2 equals 1. Notice how anytime we have an ordered pair and a function name, we can write it either as an ordered pair or with function notation. Okay, um, use the graph to identify the domain and range. Well, the domain, uh, we have arrows going on in both directions, and it's continuous. So that means, basically, there's no breaks or holes in this. We could draw it continuously with our pencil without ever lifting it up off the paper. So the domain here is actually all real numbers. So we could say all real values, all real numbers. Or whenever we have a whole bunch of numbers, it's often convenient to use that interval notation we learned last module. So remember that would be from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity. The range, we're asking what y values do we see on the graph? Well, it flattens out right here at negative 2. So basically, none of these y values are in the range. But negative 2 sure is, and all of the ones below. So the range, the lowest number, there is none, because the, the values keep coming down. If we go all the way down here, there may be some, the, the graph may continue all the way down here, and we'd find some very small uh, y value. Maybe this has value negative 20. Uh, it might be like negative 20, negative 20, something like that. So the range just keeps on going to negative infinity. But the biggest the range can ever get is up here at negative 2. So, and also notice it attains the value negative 2, so we'd use a square bracket. Okay, last one for the section. Um, the graph of a function may cross the x-axis several, several times, so the graph may have more than one x-intercept. <clears throat> so that's all we have to do is think if that's true or not. Um, so is there a function where that happens? Because for this to be true, that's all we have to think of. It says may, so we just need to find one example. Well, let's think of maybe a parabola that goes below and then comes back up. And then we ask ourselves, does such an example pass the vertical line test? Well, since I keep going to the left and to the right, the curve never doubles back, so I'm never going to have a vertical line hit it in more than one place. So basically, this picture is a function, and it certainly crosses the x-axis two times. So uh, this would be true. The graph of a function sure can have more than one, one x-intercept. Um, if you asked yourself the corresponding question, could it have more than one y-intercept? that would actually be false because if you would look at something like this that would have two y-intercepts but as soon as you have two y-intercepts guess what you fail the vertical line test so you can never have a function with two y-intercepts
Okay, so that was a pretty long uh, first section, so let's end the lecture here, and then I will get back with you uh, on the remaining sections. So, uh, good luck, and I hope you have some fun messing around with these functions.